Kia ora and welcome to another Aotearoa Rugby Pod here on Sky Sport and on RugbyPass.com. Got a big show for you today. Of course, we've got the Chiefs getting up over the Crusaders. Brennan will have a few things to say about that. The Blues, big win over the Highlanders. Some huge Six Nation action as well. And we've got a special guest through the middle of the show, Baden Kerr. Now, Baden Kerr was retired. Then suddenly he gets a phone call from the Fijian and Drua. Now he's over in Australia playing super rugby. We'll bring him into the show as well. Plus, you might have lived with one of our panellists. Now, James Parsons isn't with us in the studio today, James. You're at home because you're solving COVID issues for all the super rugby, which we really appreciate. And down in Christchurch, as ever, Bryn Hall. Massive week of action. Let's get straight into the quick fire before we completely dissect this Chiefs win against the Crusaders. Best match of the weekend. Jeez, it must be hard to go past that match. Sunday's match between uh, the Waratahs and the Force was was up there, but I tell you what, a last-minute win in Christchurch is as good as it gets, I would say, um, for a, for any fan. Um, it's, it's, I, I mean, I don't even know the last time they lost down there. I think it was to the Highlanders, potentially, um, on a, on a, in the previous season, but... Um, such a hard fortress to break down. And I mean, they had all the ball, they had all the territory and the, the Crusaders looked like they were going to hold them out. I think it was 75 minutes, 76 minutes, and it was still 21-10. To finish 24-21 um, was was massive. Yeah, that obviously wasn't my pick, personally, <laughs> um, even though it was a it was a good game. Um, I actually went for the Reds and the Ndrua, um, just for the fact of how the Ndrua came, always came back and almost won that game against the Reds. And if, to be honest, they probably did enough to be able to win it. And unfortunately, you know, the last couple of minutes, um, the Reds were able to grind that out. But um, I guess for me personally, seeing the growth in the draw over the last couple of weeks, uh, it was a great game to watch and a great spectacle, especially in the last, you know, probably 20 minutes of that game. That's a very good answer. Um, worst match of the weekend? Um, they're all pretty good quality matches, but I'd probably say maybe the, the Waratahs game for me personally. But other than that, I thought they were actually pretty game, good games all around. Most improved. Oh no, carry on. You, you're on too. Oh yeah, please give me a chance. Um, I'd probably say Blues Highlanders. I think that first half was probably um, full of errors um, and, and probably two game plans that probably didn't get executed as well as they'd like. But the second forty, um, I was at the game. It was, it was um, definitely a lift in intensity. But from a, from a mm. spectacle point of view, probably probably that Blues Highlanders match. Which team improved the most from their last match for you, Jibber? Oh, Rebels, massively. Um, I know they didn't get the win against a tough Brumby side, but they were they were definitely um, a lot better. I don't, I don't know. I mean, Bryn's the Rebels correspondent, so I'll we'll probably get his take on it. Uh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go that bad this week, Jim. I, I agree with you. I think they um, showed a lot of improvements, even though they didn't didn't get the results. Uh, but I'm just going to flow on the back of that and draw um, result as well. I think. The growth that they've had from week one um, to where they are now, um, if they continue to keep getting better and hopefully injuries, I know there might be a few injuries in that squad, but um, if they can stay healthy and continue to grow, um, yeah, they're probably the, the most proven team for me. Who's going backwards this week? Oh, I probably think the Highlanders, to be honest. I think, um, you know, being zero and four, and no, no doubt we'll probably touch into it, the reasons why, but um, yeah, they just probably haven't found their mojo and been able to get results. Um, you know, probably execution has been a big thing for them. Um, they're, they've got a lot of opportunities that they're building up in games, but for whatever reason, the execution and um, accuracy um, is just leading them, leading, they're letting them down at the moment. So I'd probably say the Highlanders at the moment. For me, it's the Reds. I thought they were fantastic. I was waxing lyrical about James O'Connor and co last week, and I just didn't think they were at their, at their best this weekend. Standout player of the round. There were a number. Jipper, who stood out for you? Sean Stevenson. I thought he was outstanding. Mm -hmm. I, I, almost to the point I'd say it was his best Super Rugby game. That's solid. Bryn? I, I, yeah, I thought Shooter was outstanding. He was my second guy. But I thought Bryn Gatlin was, was outstanding on the weekend. I think um, the way he controlled that game. And what I really enjoyed seeing Bryn was his running threat and his triple threat that he had in that game. Look, we know how well his distribution, his kicking game is, but... He really attacked the line, even though the one that he passed on to the inside to me, thankfully. thankfully. Uh, but, you know, those kind of moments where he was at really attacking the line and asking some serious questions of our, of our defense. So, um, yeah, I had Brent Gatlin for this week. And that and that was one of his one of your best defenders he went through in Tom Christie. 
that, mm. that was uh, he was seriously he was really trying to challenge that line and I think it's a um, part of his game that he uses really well at NPC level but it's great to see it at Super Rugby mm. level now and obviously he yep. played a very big part in that win for the Chiefs which was a, a part that was a, a win that probably is quite unexpected in the way that you guys just don't do that at the end of games Bryn yeah, look, I think you're right, Ross. I think for us, um, you know, you even look at probably the last 10 minutes, you know, we're a 21-10 up and um, to our standards, we probably want to put that game away. But, you know, some of the stats in that last 20 minutes of that quarter, um, you know, we, had, we attempted 136 tackles and the Chiefs had the ball for 10 minutes, whereas we had the, the, the ball for a minute, you know what I mean? So they had 78 carries, we had seven carries. So um, just due to the fact that they put so much pressure on us and, and yes we defended really well for a lot of the spurts of that 20 minutes but you know if you continue to keep giving guys opportunities and teams opportunities like the Chiefs um, unfortunately it happens on the weekend we'll be losing the 80th minute due to the fact of the pressure that they put on us so um, you are right though Ross it usually is a strength of ours coming on in the back end of a of a um, of a game especially in that last 20 minutes we back ourselves on the finishing games with our bench and even just for the result in general so um, yeah a, a tough one to swallow for sure but um, thankfully, uh, we get to play them in two weeks, and we just need to make, be able to make the learnings because we've got a really tough game against the Blues this week, who, um, you know, again, uh, are favourites for this competition and playing really well at the moment. I'd love to know um, what was said. It's such an unfamiliar place for you guys to be. What was said post match? Yeah, I, I think, well, that's your right, Jip. I think it was more so uh, we were our own, our own worst enemies in that, and look, you got to give full credit to the Chiefs and the pressure they did put on us, but you know, giving away you know silly penalties and, and crucial moments um, probably isn't us. And I, I look at the I'll probably look at the seventy seventh minute where we're closing out the game, and you know, an, an offside penalty from that kick is just so uncharacteristic for us, and we we back ourselves to be smarter and making better decisions around that. And so, um, yeah, it was it was a tough, it was a somber feeling in our in our change room to be honest, because. You know, there's been times where the Chiefs or the Highlanders have played really well and beaten us, and we, you know, you more so accept that, and you, it's a lot easier to swallow because they've just beaten you. Um, but I felt that probably that last 20 minutes were our own worst enemy and putting ourselves under pressure, and that's why it just hurts so much for the fact of um, how the game went for us, and that was the the feeling in the camp after the game. Now, you mentioned that the Blues should be favourites now. Now I remember watching the show last week, and I think James picked the Chiefs. And then he went pre-match we went, or post-match against the Chiefs on the tally, switched it all around. Um, was that the Chiefs team that you were expecting when you were sitting here last week, not the Chiefs team you were expecting when you were standing at Eden Park? Um, or or, or not Park Stadium? I, I feel, I feel a little bit about... I was hoping no one picked that up because I was going to crow about the fact that I picked the Chiefs. But, uh, when, I, when I saw the teams, I, like with Brad Weber missing... Um, I thought um, a guy that Bryn gave the plug to, um, Cortez Ratima, he was awesome off the bench. And, and I noticed you were just trying to smash him, Bryn. So you've obviously got a nice little relationship there. Any chance you got, you got onto him. But um, no, it wasn't the team I was predicting, and that's probably why I went with the Crusaders, because they're at home. Um, and, and that uh, experience and the impact, I was expecting them to get off the bench, but um, you know, full credit to those young guys that came on for the Chiefs, man. They they made a huge mm. statement in one of the biggest games they could potentially have. Um, and, and they'll be, one, buoyant from winning, but also so much the better for it for experiencing that and the big occasion and being able to deliver like they did. So are they edging, mm. Chipper, the Blues for favouritism possibly? Are the Chiefs right in that run now? Considering beating the Crusaders in Christchurch late is a huge thing to do. Well, you know... Um, I've, I have said on here earlier that I think the Chiefs are, are the side to beat um, just because of, I don't know, just the way I saw their preseason form and they're continuing to do that. Um, but then when you look at, um, you know, if you look at the Blues, for instance, you know, they probably played the better rugby and lost against the Hurricanes round one, but then have won two in a row probably by not playing the best of their ability. So I just think this competition, a long, I'm going a long way around it but it, it is going to be decided um, who who has the ability to turn up under those pressure moments um, each week. And I'd say at the moment the, the three favourites would be Chiefs, Blues, Crusaders still. But the Hurricanes are still lurking there. Can they bounce back from this COVID 
um, incident from from. That. Let's talk pressure moments with the pressure moment man himself, Bryn Hall. You're running back, a pass gets thrown, you snap it out of the air and you save a try. What was going through your mind as that was playing out? Um, oh, mate, to be honest, I was just slipping into the into the defence line and um, yeah, Brynner took it to the line and it's quite funny, I actually screamed his name when I was coming back on the inside. So you can actually hear, hear it on the telly. I have um, obviously know that he's carried it and don't know whether he's actually passed it to me knowing that I was there. I think he obviously saw Cortez in the corner of his eye but um, I made a pretty vocal um, word to, to Brynner in that moment. So um, yeah, it was just lucky in that moment being able to get into the into the right spot at the right time and um, yeah, kind of stopped the try and given another half back another try. <laughs> Stop being humble, mate. That's not luck. You make your own luck. You 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 put the afterburners on and save the day. And and not the only time. You got yourself under one of the biggest men on the field at another time as well. Well, yeah, like, he's a he's a big man, Peter Gus, and we've talked about his form and yeah, he just got on the outside of that of that line out and yeah, it was more so you gotta just try and put your body in the way and, and thankfully my mate David Harvilli was there as well, so it was a two-man a two man tackle, and, and thankfully, uh, we were able to hold it up, and which is pretty a uh, big moment in the game, actually. So, um, thankfully, fellas, a number eight actually didn't bump me off. So, come on. It's a massive play for me moving forward. We're moving <laughs> up in the world this year, fellas. Come on. He is a huge human being, so congratulations. That was a solid effort. And I was just I was telling Brenner earlier, I cheered. You know, as a man from Chiefs territory, his family are Chiefs people. I cheered when Brent took it and I suddenly started questioning everything in life. It's like, am I on the Crusaders <laughs> side now? What, <laughs> what, what is this? <laughs> mate, I'm slowly, I'm slowly twisting, that, twisting that knife, mate. I'm slowly getting ready to turn you. I'm not turning you, man. I think now that I'm retired, my wife cheers more for the Crusaders because she loves Brent so much. <laughs> Yeah, tough time there at the end of that game then. Very tough time. Um, Tupo Vai, what did you guys make of him on the weekend? Bryn? Oh, look, I thought he was, was outstanding on the weekend. Um, look, I think it's just been a massive growth for him um, with the way that he's been playing. And it's more so his offload game. Um, you know, there's an instance in that game where I think uh, we almost score a try. I can't remember, was it Ethan Blackheader? I think Ethan Blackheader drops the ball and then um, from that he gives like a, an offload, goes around the back and um, gives it to, I think, Angus Tarvel in, in that moment. And so that's what Tupo Vai can bring. And if you're looking around, we talk around the Six Nations and the athleticism of Atoje and um, where the, those kind of stocks are at the moment. You know, Tupo Vai is very similar like that where um, his athletic ability is going to be massive for the All Blacks, not only um, this year, hopefully, but moving forward and He'll be able to bulk up, bulk up more and continue to keep getting better. But look, I think the biggest question for him is that do you continue to keep playing him at six or, you know, mm -hmm. does, does, do you put him at lock? Because, um, you know, I thought he was, he could be a great six for the Chiefs uh, moving forward as well. For it's... me, he's a lock. He, he showed that on the weekend. Sorry, Ross, to jump in. No, that's right, go I, for it. I was watching the game and I was thinking, you know, he's, he's locking with Brody Retallick, one of the most physical players in our game um, against Sam Whitelock, one of the best locks, you know, Struth for however long. And he just, he stood out for me. He, he, he looks bigger. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know um, if, if it feels that way, Brim on the field, but he, he seriously looks, I'd say, five kilos bigger. And, and that presence he showed, he's still got that mm -hmm. six skill set, but it's, what he mm -hmm. did in the core roles at line out and scrum time and his clean out work, uh, along with his tough carries, when he's when he was running into a red wall, he was he was give me the mm. ball, I'll do it, um, and that's why I think he's best suited at lock, a lock that can cover six, rather than him, him looking to move to six. Would you not right on just on that, Jip? With you, if you have Josh Lord coming back, would you not want to have the you know Retallic Lord, and then also Tupo Vai in there as well? Oh. Potentially, but I thought I thought Callum Boshier made a, a great fist of his job at six. He has a good line out option. Um, you know, mm. he was good in the wide channels. And and I suppose this is, goes back to why I was talking the Chiefs up preseason is they do have um, a lot of depth and options in, in key positions. Um, and, and I think maybe he will play at six. But I, I think compared to his game against the Blues, to his game against you guys, I, I, it was streets ahead. 
and, and I think that's because mm. he's more accustomed to that locking position. Now, if we move to the other game, the Blues Highlanders game, let's talk about one of the sixes from that game because Tane Plumtree was everywhere, absolutely everywhere. What did you make of him, Jibber? Does he know his way to a try line? Because when I was watching NPC, he seemed to score hat tricks and all sorts, and he scores on a starting debut. He gets two dots. I mean, that was oh, he, he was he was outstanding. And Joey Wheeler and I were watching it um, up in the uh, comms box. And at the start, the first ten fifteen minutes, he took a few carries, he made a few tackles, and, and he had to get a bit of ice on his shoulder. And we were like, oh, this is going to test the young fella. And, man, he, he came out the other side, um, the better for it. And, and we made uh, a point of mentioning that in our post matches that, um, you know, that will be great for his career. But it really showed the cut of his jib, if you know what I mean. Like, he, he had to grit his way through a stinger. And as you know, Bryn, stingers aren't always that easy um, to, to mm. walk off um, and keep fronting up in that D-line. But he did it. And uh, he... he he also, the one thing I like, and this is a message to a lot of young players out there, is his discipline to stay in the system. He held that edge all night. And mm-hmm. that's not easy to do when you're starting debut and you want to get yourself in the game. He, he wasn't over chasing the game. He stayed in his position. He stayed in his role for the team. And he got the rewards for that. The team against them, the Highlanders, are not getting a lot of rewards at all at the moment. They're 0-4. Um, Bryn, when you look at what the Highlanders are doing, where do they go from here? Well, you look at last year, um, pretty similar around what it looked like for them last year around, you know, not playing well in the Super Rugby Aotearoa at the start of it and then playing the Super Rugby Trans-Tasman, you know, they were in a final with the Blues, you know what I mean? So they're not that far off. And I think with the playoffs format, how it is at the moment, um, it's the top eight teams and there's 12 teams. And so, you know, if you just get a win here and then the next couple of weeks and then you go over to Australia and get a few more wins in there, you know, you, can't, you can be in that kind of eighth or seventh seed moving forward but I think I touched on it earlier around um, it's the execution and the accuracy that's really really hurting them at the moment um, you look you know you look on the weekend they actually had a lot of opportunities and they were actually making some really good pay in the blues in that first half and first 60 minutes um, but again it's the mistakes in crucial times that they continue to keep making those mistakes in, in games and you know I look at the blues and around how they did in that second half you know I thought the kind of transformation that they made from the first half to the second half around their kicks off Stevie P, who I thought his contestable game was great in that second half, putting the Highlanders under pressure. And then from that, um, the balance of attack in their, in their attack um, as running as well was much more better in the first half. So I think it's, and then it's the Super Rugby Aotearoa games, Jip, you can probably allude to it after this, but the margin of error in these games are so small. You know, you look at our game, um, the margin of error is in the last 10 minutes. You know, we lose a game for that. And then for the Blues on the weekend, they were, they were the ones that were better with the transition coming out of half time, and then being able to implement a different game plan and executing it better. So um, for me, it's just the accuracy, sorry, accuracy and the execution. Um, they've just got to find a way to be able to be a lot more cr- uh, clinical and more ruthless in scoring points when they have the opportunities. Jip, what do you reckon? The, the, the Highlanders are a team for me that when their breakdown's humming, they're humming because you can bring Aaron Smith and Co into the game. And that's what they had in the first half. They were dominating the collisions. Mm-hmm. They were they were cleaning past the ball and was giving Aaron the ability to run and put teams under pressure. But more importantly, their set piece was functioning. And their set yeah. their set piece failed them in the second half. So they, they had a number of um, prime attacking op- opportunities, but it was either overthrown um, or, or bobble ball, and it didn't allow them to flow on from there. But I do agree, we do have to credit the Blues and their ability to execute their game plan much better. Because I don't think they changed game plans in the second half. I think they just executed it. Because they kicked a hell of a lot in that first half, but it was long and in. There wasn't a lot of chase line. Do you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, there was clearly a tactic of, okay, we want to take them on in our kicking game, and that's going to be the prime focus. And I think if you use Caleb Clark as the best example of that, when he's kicking um, you and he's in open space, you, that's you know, that's in his head. He's like, oh, we've got to play down there rather than, and he kicked out on the full, rather than going to what he does best and, you know, potentially allowing Finlay to do a contestable after that. Whereas in the second half, man, as you say, Stevie stepped up, Mark Talaya, Caleb, um, even Zahn um, and Rico from that chase point of view um, really allowed them to open up their game. And, and I do think that has to be credited. 
um, because we can't just look at the Highlanders and say they're in a rut. I've been with the Highlanders where they are right now. Bryn, you've been in teams with me uh, when they're when they're when we're in ruts like this, and there is a way out, and, and they'll they'll believe that. And I think their breakdown and set piece is a key to that. But what is the message that you've got in that situation that's worked to get out from the coach? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I had the right message, Ross. That's <laughs> half my problem. <laughs> but but I, I, I do think it's going back to the basics. I know it's so cliche, but it, it is. if it, When the Hollanders nail their set piece and they win the collisions and nail their breakdown, it brings their key players into the game. And that is the Aaron Smith of this world. If you go back to Dunedin last year when they played the Blues, they played on top of them. They won the collisions, and, and it was just ruthless and relentless in that 22. And, and they came away with points. At the moment, the Highlanders, before last weekend, I haven't done the, the numbers on it, but before last weekend, they were uh, 11th out of 12th in terms of conversion rate into the 22. The only team less conversion rate was Fiji and Drua, who are 12.5%. So 12.5% of the time they go into the 22, they come away with points. Highlanders are 15. Every other New Zealand team's in the 40%. And that's just not the Highlanders we know. So, so I do think just they'll come out yeah. the other side of it. Yeah, because I, I agree with you, Jip, on that, because I think even last year, or the it was last year, they were ranked number one with their efficiency in the 22. You know what I mean? And so I think... Coming back to your question, Ross, it's really, you know, some some teams you could fall into the trap of doing too much and thinking you need to fix everything because you're obviously in a bit of a rut. But I think what Jipper's points bring up, their breakdown, if they can nail that breakdown and the efficiency and being able to be brutal in the cleanouts and keep that up tempo, that's the likes of Nuggie you see in that first half, him being able to play on top of teams and then they can start getting the variety of shape that they do have. And then their set piece as well. You know, if you can continue to keep winning set piece, ball, especially off lineouts, because if they can win that, then they've got a lot of variety in the game that we've seen over the years with these special players over the top to, to the midfielder where you've got specials around the front that they can be able to bring into their game. Um, but they've just got to be a lot better when it comes into that 22-metre zone. Like Jip said, they're 11th, um, 11th in the competition where you know, they should be at the, at the top end of the competition due to how they were last year as well. Sorry, before <laughs> before we get off it, I just want to um, acknowledge Shannon Frizzell. Like I know Tane Plumtree's in my Form 15 this weekend, but... My gosh, that was a performance. He was into everything. And if you were at the game live, like JK, Goldie, myself, Joey, we were waxing lyrical about his performance. He was seriously good. His collision work and his his ability and his energy off the ball, man, he, he's, in, he's in some touch at the moment. Has been for a while too. He's, he's been very, very good for a while. Let's go and have a look at Moana Pacifica then because their start, stop, start, stop season restarts and it restarts against the Highlanders. So, do they have a chance of knocking this Highlanders team over? Oh, look, I think if you look at the performance they put in against us, um, you know, if they make the improvements that they have in, um, you know, with how the Highlanders are going at the moment, of course they have a chance to, to win this game. I think... It is a little bit unfortunate. They would, they might be underdone a little bit preparation-wise, only playing that one game and then a stop-start. Um, but look, I can can only imagine that that game they played against us a fortnight ago would have buoyed their their confidence in being in this competition. So, um, look, I think it's going to be a, a great encounter. And um, you know, if you're the Moana Pacifica team, it's probably one that you're, you're thinking if we get things right here, we've got a a possibility of getting of winning our first game in in Super Rugby Pacific. Oh, look, I think they're a genuine chance. Um, and and I, I'm probably more leaning towards that after their performance against the Crusaders. But I think the key thing to understand with that Crusaders, and I think this is a bigger factor than people know, and I might be wrong, Bryn, you can correct me, but you, you, you had a coach there who played for the Crusaders. You had a nine that had spent uh, a long time with the Crusaders. I think you said um, Kaifa spent the preseason with you, and then he was in there. So that intel is quite powerful in terms of building your confidence during the week. I don't know if that's um, applicable here. So it'll be it'll be on the work they do during the week to give themselves a chance. But understanding the Highlanders will review their Blues game, they've got 40 minutes, that first 40 minutes, to show themselves what they're capable of. And I, I actually think that's quite a powerful... Uh, tool for them as well because they've got some um, pretty formidable leaders 
um, and their one being that number nine. Now, before we go off to see Baden Kerr and probably kick Jipper out to get Baden Kerr in because that's just how we roll, let's talk a little bit about Opiki. So, we had our first game on the weekend. We obviously had uh, Chiefs Manua versus Matatu, and it was a solid win there in the end for Chiefs Manua. Um, what were your thoughts, Bryn, on how that game played out? Were you impressed? No, oh, look, I was, I was Ross. Um, you know, you look at that first, um, that first forty minutes. You know, it was a high intensity, um, intense um, first half. You know, I look at the, you look at that 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 try that was set up um, uh, from Hazel uh, Tubic. You know, that was a great advertisement for for the Super Rugby Old Picky with that level of um, the girls and how what they're playing and the ability that they have at the moment. And so, um, look, I thought that first half was a great high standard. And then, you know, I really thought the Chiefs team in, in that second half. Their defence um, was was tremendous. You know, the Mata two in that second half for long periods of time were putting a lot of pressure on the Chiefs team, and then um, just due to the fact of them not executing under pressure, um, even though they did score in the last the last minute to be able to um, take it to extra time. Look, I just think the Chiefs Manawa defence in that second half really really came true, and you know it was probably the winning of that game due to the fact that um, they held on. They Showed that kind of Chiefs Mana mindset, and it would have been great for Mata too to be able to go to extra time. Um, you know, obviously being a Crusader supporter, but um, look, I think it had everything, and you know, looking forward to seeing how this this great competition competition continues over the next couple of, well, hopefully for this week. I also think, imagine it in a non-COVID world where they get to prepare and and turn right. up as the normal competition was supposed to be shaped. And, and I suppose I want to take this moment to acknowledge. The players, the the management staff, um, NZR, all the people that are working behind the scenes to get that game away. Um, you know, it was our, f- our first game of Opiki, but um, I just think it was um, you know a, a fitting celebration of a lot of hard work that that went into getting it up and going. And and I know that it will only get better from here, especially given the circumstances that they're under to perform to the levels they did and will continue to do so through through this coming week, um, puts the competition in, in an exciting spot. Bryn, what did you like about the style of play? Um, what I didn't, what I enjoyed about it was there's two different varieties of the teams. You know, so the Chiefs, you know, wanted to play an expansive game. Mata 2 wanted to kick the ball a little bit more, but then changed their, and then adapted to be able to run a little bit more in that second half. So um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed it for that fact that it wasn't just one brand of rugby that the teams were playing. They altered and changed and adapted to what they saw in the game, which I think is a great movement for for the women rugby moving forward. I just think it'll get better and better. Like, if you look at the, um, I suppose the feedback after that first fixture, everyone's quite positive and excited, and, and I do only, I, I do think it'll only blossom from here. It's going to be absolutely great. And on that note, we're going to kick you out because we're going to bring in <laughs> Bryn's mate Baden Kerr, and we'll see you again once we got Baden back because we've only got room for two on this screen. Cheers, guys. <laughs> Love your work. Get out of here, mate. Get out of here. Okay, so now that we've disposed the Jipper, we're going to introduce our new guest in here with me and Bryn. It's 32-year-old Baden Kerr, brought up in counties, played for counties, played for the Blues, played for Saracens, played for the Heat, and then went to real estate. But he's playing for the (laughs) Drua now. (laughs) Out of nowhere, playing for the (laughs) Drua. Welcome to the show, Baden. Thanks very much for joining us. Cheers, Ross. Thanks for having me. <laughs> now, you used to live with this guy here. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was my old uh, flatmate back in the day. Up yeah. in uh, Mount Albert there. Brilliant. Was he a good flatmate? Oh, to be honest, I was a little bit younger than Bade, so <laughs> he probably had to, had to deal with a little bit more a little bit more stuff from me, being a, not a lot as tidy and probably have to dealing with a few things, um, me not being used to flatting. So, um, if anything, Ross, I probably was a... Um, was probably tough for me living with Baden. So, but um, now nah, look at him now. He's obviously over in the, with the Drua, and I'm um, looking forward to delving into a little bit around his journey with him as well. Oh, I feel like I feel like I inherited a, a few extra flatmates with Bryn. Like uh, if, if he wasn't pulling his weight with uh, cleaning, we'd often have the parents come around and help, or or his, uh, his twin brother brother Blake. Blake was an honor, honor, honorary um, flatmate, and he was always uh, tidy, loved to dance, and actually could would, would chip in to cook here and there. So. I guess uh, the family sort of picked up the slack when, when Bryn wasn't, so it was all good. <laughs> I, I completely forgot about that as well. You know, Mum and Dad used to, used to come over, actually, cleaning as well. I remember that now, actually, yeah. Just shows, Ross, how much I've grown, you know? You moved to Christchurch and you lost those privileges. <laughs> well, that's it. You know, I didn't have my mum or dad with me, so I um, obviously didn't 
didn't live with Baden and didn't have the ability to ring mum and dad and been able to, to do those things. So thankfully, I've uh, substituted that for my partner. So how good. <laughs> <laughs> so Baden, tell us, how did you end up at the Drua? When you, you think about your Super Rugby career, you probably thought it was all over. Yeah, 100%. For years, I've sort of battled, as Bryn knows, with niggles and injuries. And uh, you get to a point where I suppose, uh, especially at a certain age, we kind of want to start focusing on, on life after rugby. And I sort of got to a point where, I guess, rugby was sort of fading out. wasn't as many opportunities. wasn't necessarily playing my best or, or my best nick. Um, so I so decided to sort of let it, let it go and uh, get, got into a bit of real estate, which uh, it was never a plan ever. It was just sort of conversations I had with, with people and thought I'd, I'd do that whilst I wasn't 100% certain on my future in terms of rugby, just in terms of the study and stuff. And I'd kind of come to terms with uh, life after rugby and was starting to feel a little bit settled. And then this opportunity sprung because uh, one of our old coaches at the Blues that uh, Bryn knows really well as well is Mick Byrne. He was, uh, he's the head coach here. So he just wanted a conversation around it. And that sort of yeah came as a real surprise to me. And I don't think uh, any, any rugby opportunity um, or many opportunities would have probably uh, captured me like this one did because I suppose by by taking this opportunity it's a lot more to rugby than me like I kind of get to inherit a completely different culture and um, group of mm. boys that live a completely different way and, and in, a, in a unique place uh, in Australia here where you still got that familiarity um, so I kind of you know you can duck down to get a coffee and, and um, you still got those little I guess familiarities of home that, that make you feel comfortable whilst, whilst being somewhere that makes you feel uncomfortable which for me personally was just a great opportunity uh, to grow so for me that was the thing that kind of uh, made the decision easier for me because I'm learning so much from these lads and, and how they live and um, how rugby to them is, is, is fun and it's a privilege and it's um, secondary to, to the real basic things of life that we often forget. Just on that Baden, um, obviously mate, probably being with you having the experience of being in the county's environment, do you think that's kind of set you up for being able to be, you think about it, it's a definitely a culture shock um, obviously being um, you know, obviously, Pacific, oh, sorry, uh, a Parlangi or a Pakiha as a New Zealander, <laughs> and then going to that environment and then immersing yourself into that Fijian, Fijian culture. Do you find that being in that county's environment, understanding the, you know, the, the PI community and being in and around that um, county's um, region really helps you moving in towards for the Fiji through this year? Yeah, good question, but absolutely. I think um, I'm, I'm, I've been really privileged, as Ross knows, growing up in, in, in Papakura. Um, you know, the diversity that we have in counties in Manukau and, and the guys that I've got to play with growing up right through the age group um, and a lot of Fijian boys and, and they've always had such a special culture, as you know, when it comes to um, mm. life around the footy. And I kind of, I guess it gave me a little bit of an understanding of um, the type of people they were. And I don't think I've ever come across a Fijian that isn't, you know, super kind and welcoming and, and warm. And mm. I think having those experiences through counties and, um, and club footy at Karaka and, and, and counties Manukau too has been... Um, yeah, it gave me a little bit of confidence um, coming over here because obviously it was pretty daunting and wasn't sure how I'd be accepted. But um, those those small little interactions I had, like you said, with, with counties and whatnot have made it, uh, I guess, a little bit easier to, 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 to blend in, I suppose. That's the right word. <laughs> did you arrive late or, you know, was the squad already together when you arrived or did you arrive with the rest of the boys? Yeah, I was a little late. Uh, there was still, I think it was about six or seven of us that came from New Zealand together. And there was still another five or six maybe that were coming after. So I wasn't there with the initial group, which were there maybe about four weeks before me, um, who had come straight from Fiji. Uh, and that had a bit of a head start. And um, it was phenomenal hearing and seeing like, the, the gains they made. Like we had boys losing like 15, 16 kgs in like three, four weeks. Like they'd come from, you know, pretty dire times in Fiji in terms of COVID and real, real tight restrictions mm. with, with not much in terms of resources, as, as Brenna would know. Um, being in Fiji, there's not much there in terms of resources as it is, as it is let alone mm. uh, with, with times like COVID. So I came into into a time where they'd already been working really hard and um, obviously I had some catching up to do, but um, I was absolutely blown away by by the first dinner and, and, and everything from there in terms of how warm and welcome they all were. What's different about the culture in comparison to, say, the Blues or any other top rugby team you've been in? You know, maybe take us through what the week looks like in comparison and what's different between them. Yeah, I think for them, family is, is everything and and they're sacrificing so much to be away from family. Like, we have boys in the team that, that uh, you know, won gold medals 
uh, with the Fijian Sevens team, and they spent seven months away from family, and now they're doing it again with the with the Drua. Um, and to them, like that's that's their why, and and it's so clearly evident. And they also got a really strong uh, faith and and um, you know in Christianity. And and every single night we have what we call Lotu, which is like a little church service, and you see that they've got a greater belief. Uh, beyond themselves, beyond the game, and and I think that's what makes them so much tighter. These boys so much tighter than maybe potentially other groups in terms of culture. They don't necessarily. We don't, as Steve, uh, Glenn Jackson mentioned when he did a bit of work with the Fijian uh, flying Fijians. Sorry, they wanted to sort of implement a culture. You know, as as Brenner would know, the the Crusaders they would have worked hard on that for, for years and years, and right. they know exactly what's required of them, um, and that's something that's had to be worked at. Whereas a cultural thing with the Fijians, like if they've got something there that's so unique and so special and a, and a real unique love and pride for, you know, each other, the, their faith, their family, um, and that, that kind of side of things is hard to teach. So I think that's probably what's quite unique here. There's already an ingrained culture that it's hard to necessarily put your finger on exactly why, but it's um, really special. Like you said, the, the faith and obviously the beliefs that you know, the Fijians have and like you said, like, like that you've explained, but I feel just watching you guys probably look on the weekend, you know, you probably should have won that game if you're thinking about how you guys have been able to come back in that last 20 minutes. So I guess for me, uh, what are your goals and your aspirations as a group? And I, I know probably being in the tournament first and foremost, being able to be in and around that environment and being able to play um, Super Rugby, but I guess with the confidence that you're building and the stuff that you've talked about and then it's been put onto the field, uh, what are your aspirations as a group uh, moving forward versus this competition? Yeah, good question, man. Like we sort of spoke about it today, but where um, you know a lot of teams will have their players that are, have been there for years, and they kind of the systems won't change too much, so they can kind of you know understand them as as the you know experience goes on, and guys that you know have been in the same systems with the same calls for a long time. Um, whereas we don't have that privilege; we've kind of got to learn really quickly, and once we review a game, we can't necessarily keep making the same mistakes. So um, mm. these boys everything's brand new. That's what I think a lot of people struggle to understand. They've come from playing like club footy more or less in, in Fiji. They haven't had video analysis. They haven't had, um, you know, the, the access to certain recovery tools and things like that. So it's incredible seeing how quickly these boys are responding and picking up things. So for us, it's literally a, a week by week and we want to see improvement each week. And I think the biggest difference for us since week one, we sort of, we made so many errors in the first two games. Like we, we we barely won set piece. We knocked the ball on. We were just probably a little bit too excited. And it was all brand new. And after the game, you could see, you know, the Fijian way. You, you still got to celebrate family and enjoy the time off the field. But the difference between those first couple of weeks to the week just being where we just lost, like you say, could have easily won. The disappointment in the boys' faces because they've made such massive improvements in four weeks. Mm. This is really evident. So. We want to be a performance team. We want to win. Um, and we know to do that, we, we have to do the little things and, and, and improve week by week. So we don't try to look too far ahead. We just want to make sure that we stay within our group and improve week by week. It's a long season, isn't it? And I suppose that's one of the things that a team that's an expansion team has got to bear in mind. You know, as injuries come and all those things happen. Um, you guys appear to be building. You know, it, it seems like... You could be better the longer this goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've had an insane amount of injuries. Like it's pretty, pretty overwhelming. And to, to see how the boys have responded and, and played, considering we sort of, you know, have an old thirty-two-year-old has been at the back trying to catch Jordan Bataille when he just, you know, <laughs> makes me look like a buddy prophet at eighty-nine <laughs> minutes. But uh, <laughs> like we, you can see that there's a lot more to to it than you know, what the squad has on, on paper. So, um, yeah, the managing of injuries and stuff is pretty pretty difficult and it's new to a lot of people here, particularly uh, even even staff and, and whatnot. So it is a it is a tough tough one to manage and I know that now we're based on, on today's training, we're gonna have to really pull back a bit because we're we're rapidly losing numbers. But um, yeah, as as Brenna knows it's it's a long season. You can only really go one week at a time. Particularly when you get older, you can't really look too far ahead because you only really got that training and then that that recovery. And after that, you don't know what your body's going to do. So, yeah, it's literally just uh, one training at a time, one game at a time, and making sure that we focus on that. 
One thing that I did want to ask you, bro, um, you talked around Mick Byrne and obviously having Jackson in there is with you as well. Um, for our viewers, do you just want to give maybe an insight? Because Mick Byrne, you obviously spent a bit of time at the Blues. And I guess kind of, I, from my memory of obviously Mick was a really intense, really um, attention to detail focused man, which is great for, um, for players. But I think, has he changed that approach being with the Fijian Drua and he's kind of still has that intense side to him, but has he altered and changed it due to the culture that he's involved in with the Fijian boys? Yeah, yeah, awesome question, man. Like, he's, um, he's, as you know, one of the greatest minds you'll probably come across. Like, he seems to know everything about everything mm. and the retention of knowledge in his brain is like, you can't be human, you, you think sometimes. Um, and, and credit to him, like, he he wants to explain and make it as simple and easy to understand as possible. And I think what's really great is we've got a good balance with, with coaches because you mentioned Glenn Jackson, who's had a bit of experience in the Fijian setup. And then we've got Brad Harris, who's also had plenty of time with the Fijian boys. Um, and has a little bit of terminology and understands that it's more or less about you know the real basic um, instruction and and these boys work off visualization and repetitiveness like we just need to repeat and and go over things so in terms of, like you say the the knowledge in the chat like it's constantly spoken about because I think we often forget that a lot of these boys you know English is their second language so there's definitely a balance there and it's not always it's not always right but um no, as you say like all the coaches are really aware of it and um, it's a constant work on you. Nice. Now, you're involved in the Saracen squad when they did the double, right? Yeah, so you'd hardly say I was involved. I mean, I was there. I was a body. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you talked before about video analysis and all those things that these guys come from club footy. I mean, Saracens, I can't imagine that there's a better equipped club in the world to do those kind of things. How different was that to your New Zealand experience? How much of a step up? Yeah, I think it came down to resources, more or less. They sort of had, you know, six physios and four strength conditioning trainers, and um, they just had more, you know, kit man. Everything was, they had more resources, which made a massive difference. And, and as, as Bruno would know, like, in terms of a culture, once I got there, they said it had been sort of like a six, seven-year um, culture building that had got, to them, got, them, got them to that stage. So it wasn't necessarily something that, had come overnight for them. They'd really been brought in different people in terms of management and coaches. And, and I think the GM at the time was quite quirky and was really big on taking care of players off the field um, and making sure that they worked really hard on the field. And they just had, I guess, years of experience and um, had built themselves into that year. So again, it's just like looking or comparing, I, push, I guess comparing is never a good thing in, in any situation, but for a team that's come from an island without any of these resources and how quickly they're willing to adapt with already a culture in place, is, there's no real ceiling, in my opinion. So it's quite scary to think how good these boys could be uh, in years to come. Yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? Over a few years in the competition, you build yourself, you build a culture, you build time together and cohesion, and before you know it, you're the Crusaders and you've got... How many titles? <laughs> uh, a couple of titles. A couple of titles, Ross. A couple of titles. <laughs> don't be humble. Don't be but humble. Sorry. Don't be humble. Nah, sorry. Mate, <laughs> I, I know we've, um, we've given you a lot, of, um, a lot of rugby questions, but for me, mate, I follow your Instagram quite a lot, if I'm being honest. Um, obviously, you're immersed in a different culture, and I love seeing you <laughs> and seeing you, your um, Instagram. I love seeing it. And um, obviously, mate, you're loved up. You look very happy. And I'm more so, it's just how that kind of <laughs> happened. Is she, an, is, she an Aussie, is she an Aussie girl or did you meet her in Fiji? You just oh, look very mate. happy, mate. So It's it's funny how things turn out. Eh? You sort of come over and, you know, the question's asked, like, are you um, are you tied up at home? Like, do you have, you know, partner, wife, girlfriend, and the rest of it? And, and once you sort of say, nah, like, you know, I'm just getting into this new career and I'm not sort of tired. And they're like, oh, that's, that's great. This is, this is perfect, you know, because it's going to be tough. We're going to be living in a camp environment and, uh, it's going to be pretty restricted at times and um you know that's you're in a good position for that and it took me a week to get yarning to somebody over here and uh yeah met her and she turned out to be a pretty amazing amazing woman so it's a it's a, something i never planned on and it's sort of come out of nowhere but uh sure. yeah thanks for thanks for bringing that one up bro <laughs> no problem brother i just again you look so happy mate so i just had to get a bit of um, no, I appreciate you a bit of detail around it mate so nah proud of you as, as to you as to you Endless yeah, amount yeah. of first date <laughs> options, Baden, when you're in a new city. There, there are places you can take everywhere because you've never been anywhere, right? First date options are all over the place. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like new experiences are every single experience. So like, it's just all, it's all magical at the time, at the, at the moment, Ross. So it's just a, it's a non, non-stop honeymoon experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
fantastic. <laughs> awesome, mate. Hey, well, what happens from here with you then? So does that mean you you get married and you stay with the draw for the next three seasons over there, or you know, <laughs> Jeez, what's boy, the long term plan? We just started with Instagram. And... <laughs> 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 no, I'm pretty. I'm pretty. Yeah, uh, oh, mate, you're passing the test, here. mate. You're passing the test. You're passing the test, <laughs> mate, mate. You've always been the smart one. You've always been the smart one, me old mate. <laughs> One step at a time, eh, Brenner? No, good <laughs> on you, brother. Hey, mate. Good <laughs> on you, mate. Well, what about rugby then? What's your, your long-term plan with rugby, mate? Yeah, I think for me, as I mentioned before, like I literally have to, for me to be able to enjoy this properly, I've literally got to enjoy one training at a time because um, it's all it's all a blessing and an all it's all brand new to me again and it's um, something I don't really want to, like as Brenner would know, when we start early doors, you kind of almost... Um, a reliance on how you play on the weekend and and you you kind of value yourself on that and i kind of want to make sure that if i play well on the weekend that's a bonus to to the day-to-day and i just want to enjoy each day and Mm -hmm. obviously i've picked up an injury right now that's going to keep me out for a few weeks and um i know i don't want that to damage my time here because this might might be my last season of rugby um and that's a very um possible reality and i know i'm sort of here covering for some some injuries in terms of 10 and a couple boys coming back uh, you know, some older heads and some younger ones. And I guess I just want to contribute as much as I can, um, you know, from a rugby point of view, but also from, from a supportive and a, and a friendship point of view for these boys to help help guide them because I'm, I've become incredibly passionate and, um, you know, a massive supporter of the Fiji and Drua and the people and, and who they are. So I just I just want to be, you know, a part of the journey this season and then whatever happens after that, um, you know, will be. Thanks, mate. We, we, I think we've run out of time with you anyway. You've got to hit the road and get back to training. But uh, we, we really appreciate you coming on board. It's good to see you on the weekend. Um, uh, cheers, Rob. Yeah, yeah. And uh, hopefully <laughs> Jordan Bataille is in a long lost memory. <laughs> and you can just oh, carry on your Yeah, own. no, I've got a few weeks, few weeks to get over that one. <laughs> so it's Fades, mate. Fades, uh, cheers, Fades mate. don't worry about it, mate. I get... Uh, Taking the piss out of me when it comes to Artie Severe, mate. So it's actually nice you've been able to take the head <laughs> on this final. This, <laughs> see, this, what he's done is just bring up another I'll opportunity to bring up our Artie Savia montage. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull it out of the archive again. Hey, yeah, smart. Bring him a mate, smart. Eh? you got to take the piss out of yourself first before it's taken too much out of you. So he knows what's up. <laughs> That's it, mate. That's it. Awesome. Hey, thanks no, awesome so much, to see mate. You, Brenner. Appreciate you, bro. Cheers, Ross. Awesome. You too, brother. Good, good luck, see mate. You, we'll cover well and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, brother. I'll catch up soon. So while we're waiting for Jibber to come back online, Bryn, why don't we just have a quick chat about the Six Nations? There was, of course, a big red card for Charlie Yules in that England versus Ireland game at the very start. A head clash. Uh, Didn't seem too bad. Letter of the law stuff, I suppose. Do you feel like that should be a red card in rugby, whether it's in the law or not? Oh, look, Ross, how many red card chats have we had over the years around (laughs) how much it kind of... It's just it's tough because by the letter of the law and where it's going, it's it's a red card. And even you heard the commentary as well. Um, they were pretty clear around where rugby is going and the safety of players and seeing that as a red card. You know, you probably think you know two three years ago, you'd probably question and thinking, oh, is that really a red card? But with today's day and age, it's it's definitely a red card. And so, and look, just on that game, um, look, I think England, considering that they were down to you know obviously seven forwards in that duration of that game you know look I thought their scrum was was outstanding I think they ended up having like six six scrum penalties and having dominance at scrum time um you know with the fact that they all had the numer- numerical disadvantage of having their prop off I'm um, sorry their, their 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 lock off sorry um but I thought they did really really well and it was more so the likes of Jamison Gibson Park and I think he's been a revelation for that Irish team and where they where they've been just due to the fact that when they are playing with that lightning quick ball we've talked about their face play shape and it was evident on the weekend, but I think you know the ability that they have for taking that lightning quick ball um, was probably the difference in the end. And I think you know the accuracy wasn't to the probably the standard where they wanted it to and where they probably have been in the past. But you know for the fact that they got the job done, considering um, sometimes it is hard to play the fourteen man's team and knowing that you should win that game due to that. But you look, I look at, I also look at, at England as well. The ability, you know, I look at the, the stats in the last probably twenty minutes. It was fifteen all. And the game was right on the balance. But, you know, due to the fact that um, the bench came on and Connor Murray and Lynn and that likes of coming on, um, they, they came out the game and scored some pretty crucial tries at the back end of that of that game. So um, a little bit tough, obviously, Ross. We talked about the red card and would have been great to probably see 
20 minutes of a red card and then being able to bring someone on. But um, considering they had that disadvantage, I thought England did everything they, they could. But I think England were, um, Ireland were too good in the end, for sure. They were. There's another thing on our rundown here that maybe we could talk about while we wait. Michael Checker. He's been reappointed, or not yeah. been reappointed, he's been lifted up to head coach. Um, he's back in a role as leading international rugby team. Is that the right appointment for Argentina? I think it is a good appointment. I think Pablo, you know, Mateta a couple of weeks ago brought in, you know, they're, they're kind of used to this kind of two-year period of having new coaches coming in. But I think the advantage that they do have is that they've, they know what, what Czech is like and they've had experience in the last couple of years in that environment. So no doubt probably the senior leaders would have been involved in that with the um, you know, Argentinian Rugby Football Union around making the appointment. Uh, but look, he's been um, successful in, in the rugby championship when he's been with Australia. He's been to World Cups and finals. And he's been in that Argentine environment for a while. So considering that they were looking for a replacement and it's two years out from World well, a year and a half out from World Cup, I think it's a good appointment for them um, to the World Cup. OK, so we can finally welcome him back now. While we've been on air, I'm sure you got straight back into your work with the COVID stuff. You're back now. Let's get into the Dream Team uh, Form 15. RugbyPass.com, of course, is doing the Dream Team for Super Rugby Pacific. You go choose all of the players that you want each week. And, Jipper, you tell me right now, who is the person who came into your Form 15 for the Dream Team this week? The Bryn Twins. Bryn Hall, <laughs> Bryn Gatlin. The North Harbour combo is uh, leading the way for my 4.15. There's also a little bit of North Harbour flavour out on the right wing there too with Sean Stevenson. Um, and I do want to make mention of Alex Nankerville uh, for someone mm. that plays in the midfield and the way he performed and his energy off that left wing, he has taken the uh, blindside winger, winger spot as well. If we move into the forwards... Um, not too much has changed there. Tupo Va'i comes in at lock. Uh, Pablo Matera, I thought, was huge on the weekend. Oh. So he comes back in at eight. Plumtree and Kane uh, remain. Um, and then the two Highlanders bookends of De Groot and uh, Ainsley have slipped back in there. So a bit of change in my team, to be honest. Brennan, what about you? Uh, I'll just go straight from 1 to 15. Um, I've gone with Jeppa, like De Groot. I've gone Samasoni Takayaho, who I thought was um, outstanding set piece wise for the Chiefs on the weekend. I've gone Big Gus, Angus Tarvao, for his 50th. Um, big achievement for him. I've gone Retallic, Vai. Uh, I've gone Plumtree at 6 as well. I've gone Tom Christie. Um, he's stuck in there for uh, his tackles, and he had two crucial turnovers actually um, on the weekend. I've also gone Pablo, notable mention for Harris from the Waratahs, who is going to be. In my Form 15, one week, he's getting closer and closer. Um, I've gone Finlay Christie. I've gone Bryn Gatlin. Um, I, went, I also went Mark Tilly on the wing, who I thought was immense around uh, the Blues' comeback in that second half. I've got Hunter Paisami from the Reds, who I thought was um, as destructive ever with his ball carries. He had over 100 metres on the weekend. Um, then I've got Braden Enor, uh, Sean Stevenson, who was two tries against us. And then I've gone Zahn Sullivan as well, who th I thought, um, did respectively really well with Stevie P going into 10 with Bodie being out. So that's my Form 15 this week. Plenty of good talking points. What do you make of that, Brenner? I mean, Jipper? Uh, 12's debatable. I think your mate Dave Havili's in mine. Um, I thought he was he was pretty exceptional. I understand Hunt had a good game, but um, yeah. And, and I've put Stevie P at 15. Although he mm. went to 10, I understand that. I'm just saying from a Form 15... I couldn't split him and Bryn, so I, I thought he was uh, preferred to 15. Uh, but all in all, uh, we're, probably, we're probably aligned for most parts. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're aligned on your picks for the week. Let's go through these games now. We've got the Highlanders versus Moana Pacifica on Friday. Where are you going, Jipper? Landers. Ah, uh, yep, Landers. Brumbies Reds, Bryn? Yeah, Brumbies will go. Continue to be unbeaten. Brumbies. Drua versus the Force, Chipper. Force. They're due. This is my third week back in the Force, so I'm going to go with the Force. And if they don't win, <laughs> I'm done with them for the rest of the year. <laughs> you need to do what you did to the Rebels and go hard against them, then they'll come back yeah. and prove you wrong. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Crusaders versus Blues. Crusaders for you. Uh, 
<laughs> Blues for you. Yeah, of course. Uh, Waratahs <laughs> versus the Rebels. Jipper? Waratahs. Waratahs. How good was Will Harrison, may I add? It's great to see him back for the Tars. Mm. I think he, he was one of, the, one of the players I had mentioned earlier in the year of a potential Wallabies debut. Um, and and mm. I think he, he has really steadied the ship. Now that he's back, hopefully we'll be able to see him um, unlock that talent that's outside him in that Waratahs too. Mm. Hurricanes versus the Chiefs is the other game of the weekend. Bryn, what are you thinking? Uh, the Chiefs, they'll be buoyed by that result in Christchurch. Yeah, I'll go the Chiefs as well. Now, I want to mention that we're not talking OPIC in this because this is a pre-recorded show and it means that the Tuesday games have uh, <laughs> have happened already, so we won't be doing that. So we'll leave OPIC out of these picks for the moment. Um, let's have a look at the six Come nations. on, Matatu. Yes. Come on, Matatu. Wales, on. Italy. Where are you going on that one, Jipper? Wales. Yep, yeah, Wales. Ireland, Scotland. Bryn? Ireland. Definitely Ireland. And that leaves France, England. Of course, those two games will decide this competition, won't they? So, France versus England, Bryn. France, we've talked about it the whole year, the banana skin moments, but I think, nah, I think they will get the job done and it'll be their first title in 12 years. Is, is that correct, Ross? Something like that? Plenty of time. I don't know the stats, mate, but I know it's been a long time. <laughs> it's yeah, been a long so time. So it'll be France. <laughs> Absolutely. In Twickenham or Paris? That is a France home game. Oh, the French then. French. Yeah. And does that mean, do you think French have got the title? Yeah. Yeah. As, 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 as well as uh, the Irish played on the weekend, it'll go to the French. And that was probably. I the almost game. wish, man. I know that the I know that this round's not done, but I reckon that French Irish game was one of the best games of international rugby in a long time. It was it was great. Oh, I almost wish, Jip. I almost wish it was this week. Imagine yeah. that, you know, both teams. It would have been great to see it um, being done in the last week, but yeah, so be it. Let's organise a final. Should we? Should we start? Yeah, I was about to say, should we start jumping on the bandwagon of a final, a Six Nations final? Yeah. The Northern Hemisphere people call oh. it heresy. You don't have finals in Six Nations or the Premier League or any of those things. You have a league. You play everyone and then you call it quits. I don't need these finals. It's about consistency. That's true. That's true. I like a final. That's true. I like a final a lot. Okay, lads. Hey, thank you very much. Another great show. Plenty of talking points. Thanks for popping in and out in your busy schedule while you solve the world's problems, Chipper. Thanks again to Bryn. Good luck for the weekend this weekend against Chipper's Blues. Should be a cracker of a game. And thank you all for watching once again. Catch all the action on Sky Sport this weekend. And, of course, all of the talking points on rugbypass.com.